Greetings to all of our guests uh, who are joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Sarah Griffith. I'm just checking to see uh, how many folks we have in the, in the virtual room here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get the evening started. Um, again, thank you all for joining us for this year's, the first actually of three prior lectures that Queen's University Department of History will be hosting this fall semester. Um, we considered the options of having our, our regular speaker on campus were, were limited, and so rather than defeated, we said let's push a little harder and we'll invite three people uh, instead of our regular um, single speaker. So we are delighted to have Dr. Cindy Ermis join us this evening, and I will introduce um, Dr. Ermis and give a, a little summary of, of what we're in store for this evening. Uh, before doing that, though, I'd like to just give a little bit of an introduction to the prior lecture series, um, what that is and, and uh, uh, its mission, really. Uh, the prior lecture series was uh, funded and named in honor of the late Dr. Norris Pryor. He is, was Professor Emeritus of History at Queen's University of Charlotte. This lecture series seeks to bring to campus scholars and intellectuals who explore timely issues or broad historical question in ways that engage both an academic but also a popular audience. During his tenure at Queen's, Professor Pryor exemplified the school's commitment to an interdisciplinary and liberal studies approach to learning. The prior lecture series, therefore, is designed to honor both his legacy as a scholar and a teacher and his commitment to liberal learning by inviting speakers from a variety of disciplines to share their research and ideas with the Queen's community. That includes both students and faculty, but also alumni and local residents. The Pryor family uh, continues to support the annual lecture. Uh, Janet Nelson Pryor and her brother Norris Pryor Jr. always uh, are able to, to come and spend time with our students and also to enjoy with us the lecture and the fellowship that we have and really cultivate on the Queens campus. So we thank the family for their continued support. A little bit on the format tonight. This is a webinar format, and so the attendees uh, will be uh, able to communicate any questions that they might have about Dr. Ermis's um, discussion tonight. Um, you can do that in the chat bu uh, button or the chat box. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you should see a little uh, uh, bubble that says chat and you can go ahead and plug your questions in about any of the um, topics or curiosities um, uh, that you'd like to know more about. So this is in a, a question and answer format. So thank you for declaring buying that. Uh, the question answer box at the bottom. So it says Q and A. Uh, you can pop your questions in there and my colleague Dr. Robinson will be um, uh, collecting and curating those questions and we will go ahead and get those um, uh, presented to Dr. Ermis at the conclusion of the, the discussion. Um, we will also go ahead and put two links in that chat box if people would like, or the question and answer, if people would like to know more about Dr. Ermis's work, um, as well as her open source page, theageofrevolutions.com. We will put that in for um, the public to see and also her, uh, her website if you'd like to know more about her research background or contact her after the, um, the discussion tonight. So turning to our esteemed presenter this evening, Dr. Cindy Ermis is with us. She is an assistant professor at, of history at the University of Texas at San Antonio. At UT San Antonio, she teaches courses on early modern Europe, the history of disasters, and the age of revolutions. Uh, topics that she will be talking directly with us uh, tonight. She's published on catastrophe and crisis management in 18th century Europe and the Atlantic, as well as on digital and computational history and the future of the historical profession. 
we just had a wonderful uh, conversation with our students uh, prior to the, the lecture this evening where she talked a little bit about uh, those questions about the historical profession and teaching in the age we live in. Uh, in addition, Dr. Ermis is the editor of a volume entitled Environmental Disaster in the Gulf South, Two Centuries of Catastrophe, Risk, and Resilience, and that was published by the Louisiana State University Press in 2018. She's also co-founder and executive editor for the digital academic publication Age of Revolutions, uh, this is a fascinating page. I would encourage everyone to look at that on ageofrevolutions.com. And in addition to her book projects, Dr. Ermis has been featured in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, Stat News, the Miami Herald, and El Nuevo uh, Herald. And she's also been a guest on the BBC World News, uh, Univision, Al Jazeera, and others. Uh, tonight, Dr. Ermis will share some of her uh, current research uh, from a book project she's working on now titled The Great Plague Scare of 1720, Disaster and Society in the 18th Century World. Um, tonight, she's going to focus on a, a transnational study of the Plague of Provence of 1720, also known as the Great Plague of Marseille. And this is one of the last outbreaks of plague in Western Europe, and I think a very uh, timely subject for a number of reasons. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ermis. And again, please just go ahead and pop any questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. If I may, uh, I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, hope that it goes smoothly. <laughs> share. Does everything look all right there? Oh. All right. Looks great. Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> All right. With no further ado, uh, well, yes, like I said, first, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thanks to Queen's University and the history faculty for this, uh, for this uh, invitation. And a special thanks, of course, uh, to the audience for attending. Uh, my talk tonight. I'm delighted to share with you a little bit about uh, my work this evening, especially my current book project on the 1720 Plague of Provence uh, and what it can teach us about the ongoing pandemic, about the ongoing uh, COVID-19 crisis. I will emphasize, especially for the students uh, in the audience, the importance of history in times of crisis, but also the challenging uh, excuse me, the challenges of implementing that history, of, uh, of implementing the, the lessons that we've learned from the past when they are most needed. This, I think, is an important discussion to have, but uh, it's also one that has been largely neglected. Specifically, why do we so quickly forget what we've learned just to uh, repeat the same mistakes, right? So first, by way of introduction, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my research, uh, my, research my interest a little more broadly. Uh, I specialize in the history of disasters and crises in the 18th century uh, Atlantic and Mediterranean worlds. Although I'm trained as an historian of France and the Atlantic, my research is consistently transnational. I'm most interested in how humans understood, managed, and coped with disasters and crises, uh, not only more typical disasters uh, like fires or floods, um, but also public health disasters like disease epidemics or even human-made crises like uh, revolutions. As it happens, the 18th century was an incredibly fundamental time in the development of public health policy and the history of disaster management. Uh, the Enlightenment era also saw major shifts in the ways uh, in which disasters and their causes were, uh, causes, excuse me, were generally understood. Whereas they were previously uh, almost universally perceived as uh, acts of God and tied to astrological understandings of the universe, like uh, the position of the stars or the appearance of other heavenly uh, bodies like comets. By the 18th century, disasters come to be increasingly seen as naturally occurring phenomena. To bring it even closer to more modern understandings of disasters, some contemporaries uh, in the 18th century, like the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example, even expressed an awareness in his writings of the human element in disaster 
causation of this idea that it's actually human decisions that determine the extent to which a natural hazard adversely affects a human population. And this we can say is how many, especially those of us in disaster studies, understand disaster today. For example, uh, a hurricane at sea, this is an example that uh, Anthony Oliver Smith, an anthropologist who retired from UF, I believe, uh, used in, in his writings, uh, a hurricane at sea is, uh, is just a hurricane at sea. It's what we would call a natural hazard, right? When it's at sea, it's not a disaster, right? Um, it's not a disaster until it adversely affects a population of humans that has increasingly, for, in, uh, for instance, moved to vulnerable coastlines uh, and constructed homes in low-lying areas or homes that might not be able to withstand hurricane strength winds, uh, for example, right? In short, there are a series of questions that drive my work. How do extreme events like major disease outbreaks uh, influence society, <clears throat> politics, economics, commerce, public health policy, etc., not only in the location where they happen, but across time and space. How have societies and individuals responded to or handled these major crises in the past? And how does that inform the way we manage disasters today? What have people in the past done to clean up the mess, so to speak, and to prevent uh, certain kinds of disasters from taking place again? And most importantly, what lessons can we draw to help us manage crises today as we battle not only diseases like COVID-19, the flu, Ebola, plague, uh, and many others, but also the increasing frequency and intensity of disasters like these as a result of climate change and habitat destruction, both of which we know may have ties to the current uh, public health crisis. This last question is particularly important to me because it gets to the very heart of the value and importance of history in many ways. In my work, it's also a deliberate attempt to draw lessons from the past and to convey this information to my audience and in, 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 in my writings, right? As we'll see tonight, we can draw many lessons from uh, the past for the current crisis. On that note, let's go ahead and look at the past. The tentative title of my book is The Great Plague Scare of 1720, Disaster and Society in the 18th Century World. It's a transnational history of the 1720 Marseille Plague, or as I call it, the Plague of Provence, uh, because it uh, ultimately affected cities all over the French region of Provence and even just uh, outside of it, uh, which is well beyond the port city of Marseille, where it began in May of 1720. In fact, this last May, I should mention, marked the tricentennial of the start of this epidemic, which was one of the last major outbreaks of plague in Western Europe. As the, uh, as the story goes, the infection arrived on an ill-starred, an ill-fated ship uh, called the Grand Saint Antoine. Uh, it had spent a year in the Levant, uh, or Eastern Mediterranean, gathering goods of all sorts, silks and, and cottons and fabrics and things, lucrative goods to sell at a major trade fair that took place every year uh, in France. During its journey uh, abroad, there were a series uh, of deaths on board, many with the telltale signs of bubonic plague, which is to say the buboes or these painful enlarged uh, lymph nodes on the groin and under the armpits. Uh, normally, this would mean an extended uh, period of quarantine in one of the quarantine islands that uh, were set up uh, uh, off of the coast of the city of Marseille, but this was not to be the case this time around. Uh, the city's primary municipal magistrate at this time, a man by the name of Jean-Baptiste Estelle, uh, he owned part of the ship as well as a large portion of this very lucrative cargo. So he used his influence to arrange for the very premature unloading of his shipment into the city's warehouses. A shipment that was, we of course now know, already infected with the bacteria Yersinia pestis, again, as the traditional story goes. So uh, the purpose there was so that they could be sold soon thereafter at this trade fair. Meanwhile, we know that the deaths increased, the deaths continued, and the signs of plague were unmistakable. 
One of the many eyewitnesses at the time wrote that, quote, those who opened the bales on the day that the ship was given pass were struck with the plague and died quite suddenly, since which about 24 persons are dead in one street as well as others in the neighborhood. And this was within days of uh, the ship's arrival. But instead of undertaking emergency measures right away to try to contain the infection, officials launched a major and elaborate campaign of misinformation, going as far as hiring uh, doctors uh, to diagnose the disease as only a malignant fever and not plague. At stake, of course, as some of these officials saw it, were both the reputation of the city's leaders and more importantly, the economy of this major ancient port city, which by the 18th century had become a major commercial capital. It took uh, a full two months and many, many deaths before measures were finally imposed, but by then it was too late. Uh, from 1720 to 1722, the epidemic took as many as 126,000 lives in the French province of Provence uh, and surrounding areas, as I said, uh, before. For reference, the population of this region uh, around this time in the 18th century was about 600,000. By some accounts, at its height uh, in 1720, uh, at the height of the plague, I should say, as many as a thousand people perished per day in Marseille alone, uh, which means that maybe as many as 40 to 50 percent of the city perished. In those first crucial weeks after the start of the outbreak then, authorities in Marseille prioritized uh, economic interests over public health, uh, something that we see happen time and time again in history. As a result, what began as a few dead aboard a ship became a virulent epidemic uh, that raged in southeastern France for two years. Now, uh, all of the archival evidence that I have seen uh, in, you know, from archives across the, the Atlantic world were, uh, they, they agree that there were infected cadavers on the infamous vessel as it made its way into port in southern France. Uh, and that that, therefore, is what caused the outbreak. But it's important to note, just here, a sort of a side note, if I may, uh, it's important to note that this narrative has been recently uh, complicated, in, in recent years, by new genetic studies. Uh, which proposed the possibility that the 1720 outbreak actually may have had its origins within Europe itself in local foci uh, or hubs of plague infected fleas or rodents. I mention this because if this is the case, then there are significant lessons here about the importance of taking interdisciplinary approaches in our work, uh, lest we risk missing potentially critical information that could alter the course of our research, right? Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is little doubt that despite its, uh, its virulence, the epidemic of 1720 was successfully contained to southern France, at least partly as a result of measures that were put in place not only within France, but uh, across Europe uh, and the colonies as well. In fact, uh, the Provençal Plague represents a major moment in the history of disaster management in the West and possibly in the world at least since the second plague pandemic of the mid 14th century, uh, the beginning of the second plague pandemic, right, which is marked by the, the Black Death of the uh, mid uh, 1300s. The handling of crises in France and Europe consisted of more local or localized implementation of sanitary, preventative, uh, and relief mechanisms with little to no central supervision or guidance. Uh, this is a product at the time of the more regionalized organization of the European political landscape. By the late 17th and early 18th centuries, however, we see the monopolization of power and the expansion and intensification of state interference in previously regional or local matters. This becomes most evident in, res uh, excuse me, most evident, pardon, in responses to the plague of Provence, which uh, now came primarily actually from the capitals of the emerging nation states of Europe. For example, in France, where early municipal responses in Marseille, as I mentioned, failed to prevent the infection from spreading outward into Provence, the administration in Paris, uh, at this time, the, it was the regent, uh, there was a regent and he had moved his house from Versailles back to Paris, eventually goes back to Versailles. 
But right now they're in Paris and the administration steps in and deployed uh, military commanders from the capital to infected areas, bestowing them with unlimited authority to manage the crisis. They also uh, intensified surveillance and police presence in infected areas. They issued curfews uh, and quarantines with directions for carrying them out in all infected towns. They prohibited movement in and out of Provence, requiring certificates of health that people had to um, carry for mobility and establishing massive uh, military cordons, which is to say guarded sanitary lines. Uh, that eventually resulted in the plague wall that one can still see in parts of Provence today. Um, these, uh, these cordons were made up of soldiers standing, uh, you know, apart in, in lines across uh, the countryside, for example, right, surrounding uh, infected areas that were quarantined or closed off, uh, and they were armed, and they were ordered to shoot uh, uh, upon sight of somebody trying to cross the lines. And I have documents proving that they did have to do, uh, have to use that power uh, uh, at times. Authorities in Paris also issued trade embargoes, uh, distributed food and aid from the royal treasury, uh, and they brought smuggling practices under tighter control at this time as well. Uh, they also helped to curb uh, the spread of infection by having authorities uh, see to it that dogs and cats were slaughtered. This is an interesting one because dogs and cats uh, may help with rodent infestations, might they not, right? And if you do away with the dogs and cats, you're inadvertently uh, eliminating one of the rats, you know, they're prominent predators and uh, the plague is, uh, you know, the rat and other forms of, of vermin like uh, gerbils and, and these kinds of animals, guinea pigs in the Western United States for that matter, not too far from where I live, um, uh, are also vectors of the disease, right? If they get bitten by the infected fleas, they become infected and they can transmit it to humans if the flea doesn't transmit it to humans directly itself. So um, to further spread the, uh, curb the spread of infection, uh, authorities also saw to it that merchandise and other properties suspected of infection uh, are burned, uh, that corpses be buried, that streets uh, and homes and correspondence even be, uh, go through ritual disinfections and perfumings uh, for which they used smoke oftentimes or uh, vinegar, depending on what the object was, uh, or herbs like rosemary and lavender. Uh, authorities also designated prayer days, of course, right? They organized religious processions while all social events were canceled. Uh, brothels, large markets, inns, and taverns, right, or bars, uh, were closed in infected areas as well. Lastly, and perhaps most notably, crown control was further expressed at this time through the creation of new bureaus of health in Provence uh, and most notably in the spring of 1721, a new council of health uh, was instituted in Paris that was meant to, uh, that was to meet twice a week at the Louvre, which now is a museum, but at the time was uh, uh, a residence. Uh, so this shift, observable in state responses to the 1720 plague of Provence, coincided with the rise of state power and the gradual development of modern nation states. Essentially, crisis management was now founded on an increased dialogue between the Palais Royal in Paris and local officials in Provence, and their efforts were deemed a success across the Atlantic world for decades thereafter. Outside of France as well, in cities across Spain, uh, across Italy, for example, which the 1720 plague never even entered, I should mention, uh, protective measures against the French, uh, against the threat of infection uh, from France, right, meant uh, curfews, uh, restricted, uh, restricted movement through the use of quarantine lines and certificates of health abroad as well, uh, mandatory participation in religious processions, the suspension of festivals or other celebrations, the closure of brothels, uh, and the creation of new centralized boards of health uh, as well, like we see with Spain's new Junta de Sanidad uh, or Board of Health, which was established in response to the threat of plague from France in 1720. 
this board, I should mention, would eventually evolve into today's Ministry of Health or Ministerio de Sanidad in, in Spain. In many cases across Europe, violations of these uh, new policies that were put in place, even where there was no plague uh, to protect against the infection in Provence were enforced often under pain of death, uh, incarceration also, um, the confiscation of goods and so on. Ultimately, this style of comprehensive centralized uh, plague governance, supervision and control during the 1720 outbreak was to serve as a model for the prevention and management of disease epidemics in many parts of the world for decades as Europe and its colonies battled outbreaks of yellow fever and other diseases into the 19th century. Public health management uh, during the Plague of Provence, therefore, does represent an early example of the kind of centralized, uh, the state centralized responses that uh, to disasters that we continue to see today, that we've even come to accept, uh, expect. Consider, for example, FEMA, right? Or the US Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS, which you've heard about a lot lately uh, because it houses the National Institutes of Health, which uh, includes the National Institute of uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, right? The director of which is none other than uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. So while the plague of Provence has uh, traditionally been seen in many ways as a closing of a chapter in Europe, right? One of the last of these long series of medieval outbreaks of bubonic plague, it, it actually signified a beginning in many ways. For example, in line with the new uh, Enlightenment era understandings of disasters as resulting from natural processes, the 1720 plague also marks the beginning of an age in which epidemics are increasingly described not in terms of divine vengeance, not solely in terms of divine vengeance, but as products of commercial activity, for example, right? Uh, or lack of sanitation. This was certainly true to give you an example in England. Uh, where in 1720, a major debate intensified between the so-called contagionists and anti-contagionists. In short, the anti-contagionists argued that quarantine was useless. They were uh, miasmatists, meaning that they accepted the traditional Galenic understandings of miasma theory. Uh, very briefly, prior to the 18th century, uh, in fact, from as early as the 5th century BCE through the early 20th century, so a very, very long time, uh, and to this day in some parts of the world, disease was generally understood as resulting primarily from the presence of miasmas or bad vapors in the air uh, that threw off the balance of the four humors or fluids that were believed to determine all aspects of uh, our health, of a person's health, or even uh, of our personalities. Uh, these vapors, these miasmas could be released from a variety of sources, including corpses, uh, stagnant water or swamps, uh, but also astrological events like the position of the stars or the arrival of a comet. Uh, of course, miasmas could also result from God's desire to punish a human population for their sins. So the anti-contagionists, uh, for them, if illness comes from bad vapors in the air, what is the point of practices like trade embargoes or quarantines that only work to interrupt commerce and cause economic disaster, right? Meanwhile, the contagionists' argument uh, in the 1720s held that quarantining was actually integral uh, for preserving against uh, diseases like plague. They believe that there exists some kind of infectious material. Some thought it was a sort of uh, chemical, right? Others speculated that it might be more like uh, an actual living entity, a kind of uh, animalcule, uh, as some called it, or microscopic animal, that was transmitted in some manner, perhaps person to person uh, or through the pores. Uh, perhaps by contact, in other words, right, with a sick person, or even with objects that have uh, been infected, uh, uh, you know, somehow. If this sounds familiar, right, it's because uh, it was uh, in part this model that eventually led to one of the biggest breakthroughs in the history of science, right? The development of germ theory, the germ theory of disease, 
that took shape with the work uh, later of Louis Pasteur uh, in the 1850s and of course Robert Koch in the 1880s. In short, new understandings uh, of contagion, as I hinted before, really begin to take off in the 18th century and the 1720 plague of Provence does mark a significant moment in this shift. So my study doesn't merely look uh, at what happened in France. Instead, I take a transnational approach and I use the plague as a sort of lens to explore the diplomatic and commercial interests, as well as the social and intellectual ramifications uh, uh, and unique responses, right, to biological threat of the most important port cities of the 18th century, uh, in 18th century Europe, uh, including uh, Marseille, Paris, London, uh, Cadiz in Spain, uh, as well as Genoa and uh, Venice. The plague's influence, however, also extended to major colonial centers with which these ports, right, these metropoles were most closely associated both in the Americas and in Asia. These cities were not only the foremost hubs for commercial activity in the first half of the 18th century, but they also shared inextricably close links to one another that emerged uh, in my research, in my archival research. In fact, the Plague of Provence inspired uh, plague tracks, right? Writings about plague, publications about plague, all over Europe and North America during the plague years, uh, not just France. So publications inspired by the 1720 crisis came out of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, of course, France as well, right? Italy, Switzerland, Ireland, uh, the British colonies, so Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, Virginia, uh, and others. Though possibly more plague tracks came out of uh, London and France in 1720 than anywhere else, it's just to give you an idea of you know, how widespread reactions and responses to this crisis were. The, uh, this exploration of, uh, of responses to the threat of infection uh, across Europe, outside of just Provence where it actually took place, right, uh, across Europe and the colonies in the 1720s, reveals a great deal about how people coped and understood risk and disaster in the 18th century. And in turn, this allows us to contemplate the ways in which we experience and manage calamity in the world today. The, uh, the question I've gotten the most over the last few months, uh, you won't be surprised, I'm sure, right, is what similarities are there between the current pandemic and disease outbreaks of the past, right? Is this as unprecedented as many have said? And the answer is no, not in, certainly not entirely, right? There are, uh, there are some unprecedented elements, uh, of course. Um, for example, the sheer unprecedented size uh, of quarantines, right? There are simply more people on Earth today than there ever have been in the history of humanity. <laughs> but much of what we're seeing today actually has happened before. For example, we just learned how in 1720, right, officials in Provence were all too slow to act in response to the epidemic, fearing the impact that a major crisis could have on their reputations as well as on the economy. It is well documented that the United States government, as well as that of China in its early days, uh, in the early days of the pandemic, and Brazil and others, right, failed to act prudently in those crucial early days of the coronavirus outbreak, and that this has resulted in an emergency that is now, uh, for one, global, uh, far more difficult to predict, uh, also more difficult to track and to contain, as we have witnessed. Then, uh, as now, then, right, there were those who were more concerned with politics and the economy than with public health. We've also seen how uh, the, the way that we respond to this, you know, as I, said, as I hinted before, how we've come to rely on the centralized government or centralized agencies, uh, like those I mentioned earlier, to step in in times of disaster, not just public health crises, but, you know, hurricanes or, or massive earthquakes or the fires in California or whatever, you know, we're expected, we expect the, our, our centralized government to step in and help mitigate the crisis. And this is uh, something that uh, very much emerges in the, in the, in the, uh, with the plague of Provence. It's just a major moment in the centralization of disaster management, right? But there are other ways in which what we're seeing today has happened before. 
then as now people viewed disease as coming from faraway lands, from them, not us, right? Um, by the 1700s, the plague was sometimes even referred to as la peste levantina or la, la, la peste levantine, the, the Levantine plague, uh, referring to the region of the world uh, occupied by present day uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and much of Turkey. And yet recent genetic studies have revealed that plague outbreaks throughout the early modern period of Europe, roughly between 1500 uh, and 1800, right? could actually have come from plague reservoirs within the continent uh, of Europe rather than on trade ships from the Levant, right? Which I, uh, which I mentioned in the beginning of, of my talk. Such a possibility, though, would never have entered the minds of people living in Provence who insisted uh, on adopting more Orientalist narratives that survive to this day. Efforts to call the, you know, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2, right, the, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, efforts to call it the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus uh, stem from a long history, actually, of epidemiological scapegoating, when, in fact, uh, genetic testing recently has revealed that most of the cases of COVID-19 in New York uh, came from more, most immediately came from Europe, not Asia, by that point. Rampant misinformation is another theme that unites the Great Plague of Provence and the COVID-19 pandemic. In the 1720s, rumors and paranoia became a problem not only in France, but all over Europe, as well as the colonies in the Americas and Asia, as people struggled to separate fact from fiction. Many even complained of the dangers of lies during public health crises, as when one person uh, protested in 1721, I quote, Another great cause of our present terrors of the plague is the giving a too hasty belief to every idle, ill-grounded story concerning it. Thus, we are liable to the whimsy of every petulant news writer who are made the instruments of designing men to bring the plague amongst us or drive it away again as it may serve a wicked turn. Facebook comes to mind, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> right? where social media platforms uh, and right-wing populist outlets serve to amplify misinformation today, local newspapers and pamphlets, uh, old-fashioned word of mouth as well, provided this disservice in the 18th century. While more limited in reach, of course, the evils were very much the same. Then, as now too, the idea that disease does not discriminate, right? This idea that disease affects everyone equally could not be further from the truth. During the Great Plague of Provence, wealthy residents in cities, not only in France, but all over Europe, who worried about the plague spreading to their own regions, swiftly departed for the countryside, leaving in their wake both social and economic ruin. In the last few weeks, uh, or you know, certainly in those early uh, months of our current pandemic, New Yorkers have done much the same uh, thing, right? departing for destinations less affected by COVID-19, right? This was, I mentioned New York as the example because it was most, uh, it was uh, well documented in, uh, in a lot of uh, articles uh, recently. In 1721, British observer remarked uh, on the evils of the plague's unequal effect. Uh, this is an excellent quote, I just have to share it. Tis worthy of our notice that in contagious or public visitations of that nature, the weight of the judgment generally falls heaviest upon the poor. Not that it is more immediately sent or directed as a plague to them, but their unhappy circumstances in a more special manner expose them to it than others. The rich, alarmed by the dangers of the infection, fly the infected ground and by all possible ways shift themselves into retreats and remote places that they may have air and be free from the necessity of coming into crowds or conversing with the sick. By this means, trade stops, employment ceases, and the poor wanting work must of consequence have their subsistence cut off. This immediately reduces thousands of families to inexpressible misery and distress." End quote. Were it not for the 18th century kind of language, <laughs> right? This could have been written today. Right? And in some ways it has, time and time again. It is the poor, along with racial and ethnic uh, minorities, 
who are suffering disproportionately from the health-related economic effects of this pandemic, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. African Americans, uh, just like during this so-called Spanish flu, the 1918 flu, which I'll go ahead and come back to in a moment, uh, but also Latinos, right? And uh, lower SES communities are, are most vulnerable to both the disease and its financial effects. Uh, they're less likely to have access uh, to health care, uh, to health insurance, right? They're less likely to have savings. They're more likely to have pre-existing health conditions, including hypertension, obesity, uh, diabetes. All, increase, uh, all of these increase your, uh, one's vulnerability to COVID-19 complications. They're also more likely to work in low paying frontline jobs that risk exposure, right? Like cooks or farm and food industry workers, uh, groceries and so on. And there's also more of a need uh, for these people to get, to leave the home, you know, to not, to have less, li they're, they're less likely to order groceries, for example, for delivery, more likely to have to leave the home um, and expose themselves to risk uh, because they're less likely also to have internet or credit cards or Amazon accounts for example, right? Immigrant communities might seek, uh, might fear retribution if they seek help. Another lesson that we can draw from public health crises uh, of the past has to do with the premature reopening of society during uh, epidemics and pandemics. For this, I'd like to take a quick look, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, at, the, at a more recent disaster the 18, the 1918 influenza known by the misnomer, uh, the, the Spanish flu. It was called the Spanish flu, uh, you may know because, uh, not because it was a Spanish flu at all, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, it's a misnomer because um, there was a large, speaking of campaigns of misinformation and the long history there, there was a campaign of misinformation even more widespread uh, during the 1918 flu. Um, they didn't want to cause a panic. It was wartime. They didn't want uh, people to know what was really happening and the numbers that were actually suffering from the flu. And so uh, many places uh, in Europe and certainly in the United States clamped down on information uh, and, and, and uh, utilized censorship, right, to keep people from knowing what was actually happening. Uh, not the case in Spain. Spain was actually uh, most uh, open about what was actually happening related to the flu, and so it gets named the Spanish flu. Oops. Um, here in the United States, the Spanish flu took approximately 675,000 lives. Again, then as now, closures and restrictions came too late. Uh, and when they did come, they were uneven and way too short. In 1918, uh, much like in the present, cities across the U.S. began lifting restrictions only to have to reimpose them uh, at the cost of many, many lives. San Francisco was one of these, to give you an idea. When the number of cases uh, came close to zero, uh, city officials decided to have a, a, celebratory, a celebratory parade downtown, only to see the number of cases soar soon thereafter. Uh, we saw actually, uh, to bring it close to home uh, to you, we see uh, this happening uh, in cities in North and South Carolina as well, but all over really. Um, history has shown us uh, that cities that implement and maintain aggressive interventions throughout a pandemic actually experience better economic uh, outcomes and rebounds once the crisis is over than cities that experience higher uh, numbers of deaths uh, as a result of looser or shorter interventions. The lesson is simple. There is no healthy economy without a healthy populace. And despite there being that lesson, uh, you know, even as, as, as recently, you know, more recently than 1720 was the 1918 uh, flu. And, uh, and yet uh, we opened far too early, uh, evidenced, right, undeniably evidenced by the last uh, weeks of, uh, of uh, just catastrophic numbers uh, of cases and deaths. In fact, researchers, uh, researchers have actually found that during the Spanish flu, the earlier the interventions began, the more lives were saved. The longer the interventions lasted, the lower the cost in lives as well. Cities that removed their restrictions early were more likely to see a second wave of infection uh, and death 
uh, and the more interventions were used all at once, the more effective, of course, they were at dampening the spread. So um, people, myself included, are understandably anxious for things to go back to, to normal, so to speak, right? But uh, we also all have to come to terms with the fact that there is no normal in times of pandemic. And getting to a place where we can begin to work toward normalcy, however we may define that, necessarily takes time and sacrifice. Looking to the future, the most effective way to bring about an end to these restrictions is not by ignoring the threat, pretending it's not there, uh, you know, pretending that it's less of a threat than it is, but instead by committing to protective measures, uh, ideally upfront, right? If we had done it upfront, we might have very different outcomes, more like what we've seen uh, in most of the world um, today, right? That have seen their numbers just dip uh, dramatically. But um, at the very least, we can you know, keep these things in mind as we move forward. And so I'll end, uh, I'll end my, my talk uh, with the same question I asked at the beginning. Having learned so many lessons from the past, having lived through even deadlier pandemics than this, having documented where we went wrong along the way, what mistakes to avoid, why do we nevertheless forget or ignore those lessons just to repeat the same mistakes again? This is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and there's no simple answer. Uh, there's no simple answer neither to explain why this is the case nor to propose a solution, right? In recent months, many have said that the COVID-19 crisis uh, will change American society and politics. Perhaps, for example, I've seen people ask whether it'll finally fix our flawed healthcare system or whether we'll build an infrastructure, a stronger infrastructure to prevent the next pandemic or whether we'll change the way we interact in public places in the longer term and so on. History has actually taught us that this is not the case. In fact, uh, after the 1918 pandemic, the number of hospitals in some of the most hard hit cities actually declined. Uh, including cities in North Carolina, despite the need for more hospitals during the actual pandemic, of course. In the shorter term, this is not bad news strictly, right? Uh, even though it may not look like it now, no matter, this, 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 this tells us that no matter how uh, terrible or how traumatic a pandemic is, for those of us, uh, for those of us, let me not be <laughs> presumptuous, for those who survive it, uh, things do always go back to normal. People forget more quickly than perhaps we should, and the whole thing becomes, uh, again, a subject only for historians. But therein lies the rub, right? As Shakespeare said, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. And so rather than end with an answer to that question, I'll leave that sort of a conundrum just floating there for all of us to think about uh, in the hopes that perhaps confronting this age-old problem can one day somehow yield uh, the kind of change necessary to actually learn from the past. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Hermes. We, we uh, really appreciate you taking the time to share your research with us and also to place it into the context of the situation that we're all facing right now. Um, so for those of you in the audience, we would like to invite you to share any questions that you might have for Dr. Ermus in the question and answer um, portion of your screen. Uh, and uh, we will uh, um, take some time now to have some conversation about what we've learned and um, to follow up on any questions you might have. So um, uh, none are in there yet. Um, and uh, I might uh, give people a moment to type things up or to, you know, uh, kind of process their thoughts. Um, and I'll also take advantage of having the mic by asking a question myself to start us off. If that's all right. Thank you, of course. Um, one of the things that uh, kind of stuck with me from earlier on in the presentation was your comment about um, the somewhat fortuitous rise of state power in France that somewhat coincided with the 1720 mm -hmm. outbreak. And so, so, you know, um, I know that, you know, you kind of distinguish between the local response and then the broader national response that seemed to be a little more effective. Um, and I guess my question is, to what degree was that uh, simply a happy coincidence? Um, and, and then to what degree did state power react to or benefit from or change 
following the um, the epidemic. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just kind of curious about that. Or was it another case of um, you know the pandemic sort of being quickly forgotten? Right, uh, and there was that element was there as well uh, in some ways. But the uh, this kind of rise of state power preceded the plague, right? In uh, France, uh, for example, uh, which I look at closely, of course, uh, and and where of course the plague uh, began or took place, we had already seen uh, over previous decades an increasing reliance on the the state with a capital S, if you will, uh, in times of not just uh, larger crises like this, but also for uh, the kind of uh, the kind of um, everyday things that used to be services, I should say, that used to be provided by the Catholic Church. France was a Catholic country then at this time. And so, um, which is to say welfare, right? Or taking in the poor, taking in the sick, or uh, taking in oblates, right? Uh, or, you know, abandoned children and, um, and providing uh, service to uh, in the lazarets or in, in hospitals uh, and, and things like that, we start to see an increasing look to, uh, to the government for, uh, for this kind of aid. And of course, this doesn't happen overnight. Um, we, can, we can date, you know, the, the beginnings of the formation of a sort of centralized state to different times in history. And maybe for my purposes, I tend to look, uh, you know, to the, 30, to the end of the 30 years war, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, wh where we see the, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, we start to see kind of the, on paper the, 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 the language about a balance of power and about uh, the power of states. No state can have too much more power and every state is sovereign and, and all of this kind of stuff. It starts to kind of cement our views, you know, of cement the views that, uh, about the state that we have today, closer to how we look at it today than, than to previously, if that makes sense. And so the plague takes place, and we have this occasion to actually exercise, right, our, uh, to, act, to, to flex our muscles in these ways, right, to, to exercise this kind of centralized power. Uh, it also, you know, you, you call this sort of a, a fortuitous or a sort of coincidence, and there, there's definitely an element of coincidence there because it so happens that on the ground in Marseille, I mentioned the, the early failures, right, of the administration and uh, by municipal authorities, right, who, um, who just kind of allowed this thing to get a lot more out of control than perhaps it might have been, right? I guess we'll never know how it might have worked out other word, uh, otherwise. And so the state uh, steps in and says, all right, we're going to, we definitely don't want this thing to come to Paris, <laughs> right? So we're going to step in and we're going to take care of it ourselves. And therein kind of lies the beginning of this sort of tradition. Now, I should mention that, like, like most things in history, it was not a neat incline or decline, however you want to look at it, in terms of centralized state uh, disaster management. There were a lot of steps forward and steps backward, so to speak, right? Um, and so we see, uh, you know, cases after the 1720 plague where certain crises might have been handled uh, more locally than anything else. This continues in the case of Italy, for example, a little longer just because of the, the, the way the Italy was politically uh, set up. But, you know, even if we look at today, I think of uh, Hurricane Harvey, you know, down the road from me just a few years ago. We live in, you know, this, uh, this uber nation state, right? We absolutely have these expectations from the capital when disaster strikes and when the capital does not step in, if they show up late to New Orleans or in 2005 Katrina, for example, it's a massive failure, right? Um, and yet we see, for instance, with uh, the case of Hurricane Harvey, uh, again, we see a kind of uh, a, a, a return to a reliance of local responses that were so, you could, one could argue, were so much more effective in the short term in those early days after the hurricane um, than, than the state that took a while to arrive and to send aid and everything else, right? And so um, I like to say that this plague was a major moment in the centralization of disaster management, very much akin, you know, in some ways to what we see today, but that's not to say that that is the end all be all, right? Or that it even remains uh, the end all be all today. Thanks so much. Um, we have some questions popping up here and um, I think,
Um, let's see, they will show up for folks um, and I'll put them in the Shut other in. chat window just in case that helps people see them. Um, uh, Dr. Emmis, can you see the question from um, Patricia Coppolis here? And it says, thank you for the talk. Um, oh, I would like to enough. hear more about the influence of the current genetic studies on historical interpretations of disease spread. She's a biologist. And so oh, great. just curious about the interdisciplinary side of this. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little more on that. And then we've got another question or two we'd like to fit in after that. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, the genetic studies, they're ongoing. I should mention that they're ongoing. They're by no means um, necessarily conclusive or some are more conclusive than others. Basically, what we've seen is that uh, biologists have been able to get at the DNA of, uh, of plague victims that, uh, you know, in, uh, in, that have been buried uh, in different parts of Europe. There's different plague burials that they have kind of gone back to. And there's some new ones uh, emerging ever so often. Uh, and some of these include, for instance, uh, the, more la the later plague uh, outbreaks in Europe, which have allowed us to kind of to, uh, to trace the, uh, the, uh, the genetic makeup of these diseases and to therefore see what strains they are related to, which strain did this particular outbreak uh, come from, or which one is it most similar to, right? And so what we find is that, for example, to use um, some of the, uh, the findings from plague burrows that have been, uh, that have been examined in, uh, in England, in London, uh, and these dating from the 17th century, from 17th century plagues, uh, plague outbreaks, I believe the 1665 outbreak is probably the most likely one off the top of my head. Um, we see that rather than these strains being uh, identical to what we might have expected them to be at some point years ago, which is to say from China, because we do know that the Black Death me seems to have uh, originated in the mid 14th century as far east as the Mongolian steppes, right, or China. Um, and therefore, you might expect that to be the case to for these strains from the later outbreaks of plague in Europe to, to be closer to foreign strains, and not necessarily even China, I guess it mentioned China, but also uh, if they came from trade in the Levant, then wouldn't they be identical to strains from, uh, from, uh, from other parts of the world, right? And not necessarily Europe. And instead what we see is that they are strains that you find from uh, unique strains from uh, foci in Europe itself. Uh, which is to say that, you know, it, it kind of leads one to assume that there are reservoirs of plague-infected uh, fleas and or rodents living within Europe, uh, and there are a lot of theories. There's this, the, as far as where these are located, uh, this, is, this part is all speculation, really. Um, you know, I've seen the Alps mentioned, for example, uh, and, and other places in, in the south and the east. But um, the assumption is that there might be plague, there are plague foci within Europe. So these plagues happen, the plague happens in, in the mid 14th century, uh, and there are windows of time between new outbreaks. And some of these later outbreaks are said to have reemerged from localized uh, outbreaks, excuse me, localized hubs of disease that actually became established during the Black Death, right? For example. So what this would mean is that despite what contemporaries in the 18th century believed, which is to say that all of these, outbreak came, all these outbreaks came from abroad, specifically from the Levant, right? From the Eastern Mediterranean, from these uh, places from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, if they came from within Europe, that kind of really changes uh, the history that we tell, doesn't it, right? And so um, my point for bringing that up is, is you know, uh, and it comes up a portion in my book as well, is you know, just to kind of point to the importance of interdisciplinary research because we might be missing out on things right? like this if we didn't have our ear to the ground on what's going on in genetics or in anthropology or uh, as a disaster historian in sociology or geography as well, right? And so on. So, does that answer your question? I hope. I'm not sure if she's able to. Right, uh, right, yeah. <laughs> you can uh, pose another question, I suppose, but I, I'm gonna say uh, that, it, that it does in my perspective of, uh, here. Uh, um, <laughs> So uh, we, uh, in the interest of time, uh, won't be able to field a lot uh, of additional questions other than the ones that are already posted here, but I'm sure. going to um, pose another one to you. And this one comes from one of our recent gra uh, graduates who's now in graduate school. So hi, 
uh, Becca uh, from all of us in the history department here, and thanks for the question. Um, and uh, she asks, uh, she says, thank you for coming to speak today. My question um, is with uh, sort of now we have a modern presence of social media and you kind of referenced that. Um, and so have you found then that COVID has been communicated so much more on a global level? There's a global conversation about that. One, presume, one would presume that that is much more of, um, of a sort of a global um, conversation than the 1720 plague, which of course didn't have the technology uh, mm -hmm. then. But you, the, at, at the same time, I, this, I'm adding to the question here, you did show us that there's a transnational kind of um, reaction. And so I guess if you wouldn't mind speaking about the, the sort of the means of communication about um, the plague in, in comparison to our current situation. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, there's, um, uh, there's, I mean, just the, the extent to which the globe is connected today, right? And the lightning speed to which we can communicate across the globe, you know, uh, uh, one in, in a moment's notice is, is incomparable. We've never, you know, there's, uh, it, this is just, um, this is another element of the current crisis that I would say is unprecedented. This was not uh, even what we saw in 19, with the 1918 flu where, uh, where uh, you know, human flight was still uh, nascent, right? Mason, excuse me. And so, um, and yet, <laughs> for considering, you know, for, for being the 1700s, the corners of the Atlantic world, at least, that I have found information and letters about the 1720 plague, it's, it's impressive. Given that there was no internet, of course, at the time, and that there was no, um, there was no uh, you know, telephone and television and everything else, information about what was going on uh, in Europe may have taken time to cross the Atlantic. It took uh, months at times, right? But, but, it, but it happened, right? And information was transmitted uh, in ways that I have been impressed by, as even as an 18th century historian. Um, people knew what was going on abroad. There were newspapers both in the uh, Americas and of course in, in Europe, uh, publishing, you know, printing information and snippets, what we would now probably call snippets, and publishing letters about the plague that was going on in France. And these were printed, you know, across, uh, across the Atlantic world. And as I said, the Asian colonies as well. So it kind of is you know, even more global. Uh, and for that matter, people knew what was going on uh, because of trade, right? And relationship, trade, relate, com commercial relationships, people knew what was going on in, down in the Ottoman Empire and in this e the Eastern Mediterranean that I've brought up several times, right? And so although it was not, it didn't, uh, it wasn't as quick as it is today because of uh, the internet, right? It, it was there. It was absolutely there, uh, as I said, in ways that, I, that have uh, impressed me, even, as, as a specialist in that, in that century. Thanks so much. And then I think we'll um, take time for one more. Um, sure. uh, apologies to those of you who've asked a question we didn't quite get to. There were a couple about um, uh, you know, following up on the issue of sort of the role of the central government versus local government. Mm -hmm. But since we've, you, know, you, you uh, addressed one question, somewhat about that. Uh, I'm going to skip to one from my colleague, um, Aaron Socha, who uh, brings up the case of Antoine Lavoisier in the mm -hmm. late 1700s, who was um, working as a chemist um, and uh, ended up uh, being, um, well, executed um, ultimately by the French government, uh, um, the revolutionary government, I the suppose. Front, I was going to say the revolution, wasn't it? Yeah, during the revolution. It's fascinating, um, yeah. The question is, is, is um, in reference to whether or not you can think of other instances of governments going to rather extreme measures against scientists, either maybe after plagues or disasters, you know, the idea of, you know, um, to what degree are governments in the area you're looking at relying on um, expertise of, um, of scientists, doctors, and to what degree are they um, sort of resisting their advice? That's a, a, another excellent question. In the, certainly in the first half of the 18th century, which is what I look at primarily for this particular project, there is still quite a bit of resistance to, um, although we see the professionalization of, the, of, of natural history, right, of the sciences with the uh, academy in France, for instance, right, uh, and of course uh, the Royal Society in, in Great Britain, uh, there is still, uh, there are certain narratives that are, that are accepted and those that are excluded, 
And those that are accepted are fine. Those that are excluded, whether they're right or wrong, are, you know, their, their, their name is mud, so to speak. And so, um, and so although this early part of the 18th century is, is key, it's integral in the kind of discussions that were taking place that will result in major changes, not only in the way we view or understand contagion and also the occurrence of, of natural processes and disasters, but also in uh, the extent to which we rely on scientists uh, for uh, information. Uh, in the earlier half itself, there's still resistance there, right? And so, for instance, physicians. Uh, physicians during the 1720 plague were very much there, were very much present, uh, and at a, at a more sort of official level, they were consulted, right, and hired, uh, in fact, which I mentioned earlier, right, some were hired, in that case, to lie, but nevertheless. Um, but by the general populace, in terms of how the average you and me perceived these people, you know, these doctors, they weren't trusted. People didn't generally trust physicians uh, in, this, uh, in the early modern period. Um, they were seen often as quacks, as a waste of money, um, and uh, you know, as potentially dangerous even, right? Uh, I'm sure that maybe people on the ground saw uh, more than once a doctor bleed someone to death, and although the understanding was that bleeding was a good thing, right? On, like I said, on the ground, there were suspicions there. Um, that perhaps uh, you didn't need a physician, you were better off without one. And you know, we have, of course, writings, contemporary writings, uh, giving us uh, these kinds of, providing these kinds of impressions. And so it was with, uh, with, with scientists to some degree as well. There were scientists that were working at the time, uh, at, not as part of the Royal Society or, our, or the Académie Française, and yet were coming up with really valuable uh, truths and, and studies that were nevertheless uh, excluded for not being, uh, this, this goes for, for women, of course, right? Of course, by, just by virtue of being women, they were excluded. And so the work of, of women and, of, uh, and other thinkers at the time uh, were necessarily left out. We start to see more of a, a reliance on or an acceptance of science uh, and the sciences and scientists in times of crisis and public health disasters toward, I would I would probably argue toward the end of the 18th century, um, perhaps uh, post Jenner, right? Post Edward Jenner, which was the first uh, inoculation uh, uh, for smallpox, right? Um, so yeah, I would probably say that um, it, it took time, right? It took time for that kind of reliance to, to reach the, the average person, certainly. I mean, for that matter, look at us today. <laughs> <laughs> We're still trying to figure out, you know, there, there's still resistance to the sciences and there's still a very palpable climate of anti-intellectualism that plagues, pun intended, uh, us today. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Griffith, for a uh, uh Thank you so much, Dr. Ermis. And I have to say I'm chuckling because I think this last question about uh, scientists and the value of science and relying on them when the feedback might be useful and less reliant or, or unwilling to listen when it's less, it's, it's just very uh, uh, present. And so, uh, you know, this is a perfect way to start and kick off our history for our, our time uh, prior lecture series. So we uh, just thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, out here in Charlotte, North Carolina, all the way from Texas. And um, it's a fascinating talk. Um, I did uh, have our, our great um, tech experts go ahead and put the ageofrevolutions.com link in the uh, response to our attendees. It's just a really fun and fascinating uh, website that has all sorts of authors. Again, Dr. Ermis uh, co-edits and, and helped found this page. And so lots of great, just uh, fascinating um, history taking place on that. It's fully open source, so anyone with an internet mm -hmm. connection can access that. Um, and also has your web page in there. If people did want to follow up with you um, and, and uh, ask additional questions, you can go ahead and, and look at that link. Um, so the last little bit I will say on October 9th, those of you interested, we will have our second uh, prior lecture speaker, and that will be Dr. Robert Green, who's going to be discussing Martin Luther King and a Black usable 
past. Uh, that will be also at 7.15 kickoff time. And then our third speaker will take place on November 9th. And that is Professor LeRae Umfleet, uh, who will present A Day of Blood, the 1898 Will Wilmington Race Riot. And so we're gonna have a person who really focuses on public history there. So people who are interested in, in the value of public history in particular will, will be good to come out and see that. Um, so again, if uh, you would like to um, uh, ask any questions uh, following, just go ahead and contact Dr. Ermis, and we appreciate so much everyone attending. Check that uh, uh, calendar events page on the Queen's website for the next two lectures, and we hope to see more of you there. Thank you, Dr. Ermis. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a, I'm honored. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hope everyone Bye has everyone. a good and safe evening. Keep well. Take care. Thank you.